All right, so happy Thursday, everybody. Hopefully you're having a great day wherever it is that you are joining us from. Welcome to today's webinar. So my name is Jenna and I work for Emerging Destinations. We represent cool companies and cool places. To provide a bit of background, um, you know, we've been doing these Guyana webinars for quite a while now, but Emerging Destinations is the North American rep for the Guyana Tourism Authority. So they handle all of the promotion and product development for the destination of Guyana. Today I'm being joined by Nicola and Candice, who both work for the GTA. They're coming to us live from Georgetown, Guyana, with a great presentation on community-led tourism. So Nicola is going to start us off with a brief introduction of Guyana, and then Candice is going to talk to us about the role of Indigenous tourism within the country. So we have a very great presentation uh, prepared for you today. Before we get started on that, I wanted to take a quick minute to introduce our portfolio to you. Of course, today we're talking about Guyana. You can see in the top left there, the Guyana Tourism Authority. I'll just introduce our South American portfolio to you today since we are talking about Guyana, which is in South America. So we have Hotel Las Torres and Fantastico Sur, who are both in uh, Cerro del Paine National Park in Patagonia in Chile. We have Cruz Andino also doing Patagonia in both Chile and Argentina. We have Jungle Experiences who do the Peruvian Amazon River cruising in Peru. Uh, Terra Nova as well in Costa Rica. And lastly, we have the Grand Hotels Lux who are in Uruguay and Argentina. So we also, in addition to that, do have an African portfolio and a small ship polar cruises portfolio, as you can see from the logos there. So if you have any questions about any of the other clients that you see there, or if you'd like any information, if you want to order brochures, or if you'd like to uh, schedule a private webinar training session for you and your team, please feel free to reach out to me. My email address is at the bottom there, just jenna at emergingdestinations.com. So if you have any requests or information you'd like from me, please feel free to reach out. A couple housekeeping items to go over before we begin. This webinar will be recorded, so if you need to step away, answer a call, anything like that, don't worry. We will be sending the recording out to everybody next week, so you can anticipate that in your webinar follow-up. Um, we'd also like to welcome you to participate throughout the webinar, so if you have any questions or comments that come up as Nicola and Candice are giving their presentation, please feel free to type those over to us using the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we, we will answer as, well, I will get them, sorry, to answer as many of those questions at the end of the webinar as possible, time permitting, of course. If there are any that we do not get to, we will make sure to send them all to you in our webinar follow-up. So you will get answers to your questions even if we don't get to them in this session. So. On that note, I'm going to hand things over to Nicola, who's going to start us off today. So over to you, Nicola. Thanks, Jenna, and welcome to everyone. Um, today, we are very excited to carry you through some of our community-led and own tourism products, and more specifically, one of the communities we have been working on um, very closely with for the past two years. So with this, let's just take a trip to Morocco Bay. As Jenna mentioned, my name is Nicola Bauram. I am the Senior Officer of Marketing here at the Guyana Tourism Authority, whose main aim for our destination is the development and promotion of sustainable tourism in Guyana. Today, I am joined by Candice Phillips, who is one of our Product Development Officers or Travel Industry Development Officers within our Travel Industry Development Division here at the GTA. One of her primary roles and responsibilities is working with these indigenous communities and other areas of tourism development here within Guyana, so that we can spread across a lot of the product and tourism experiences across the country and to new areas and experiences as well. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So this webinar is going to be a little bit in about three parts. Um, the first I will take you through, which is giving you an introduction of, to the, of the destination for those who have not before joined the webinar or might be new to Guyana. Candice will then carry you through Morocco Bay specifically and some of the other products that we are developing. And towards the end, given that everything that is happening in the world today, we're just going to share a little bit of what is happening with COVID-19 in Guyana right now and what you can expect when traveling to Guyana. So Guyana is a rare kind of place. 
one where you can find nature's beating hearts. As you can see by this picture here, it's filled with green, lush vegetation, pristine rainforests, and lots of mountains in some of our areas. It's a small South American nation, just about the size of Idaho, and it's sandwiched between Venezuela, Suriname, Brazil, and the Caribbean Sea. We're the only country in South America where English is the official language, all, and although we're found in South America, our history and culture is very reflective of a mixture of Caribbean culture and South American cultures as well. Some of the airlines that served Guyana pre-COVID were Caribbean Airlines, Lias Airways, Copa Airlines, American Airlines, with connections with Virgin Atlantic, Suriname Airways, British Airways. And these connect to most of our key markets, such as North American areas in the US, Canada, UK, Germany, and other British areas. So since COVID-19 happened, we do have some flights that just recently shared um, their updated plans to fly back to Guyana. Currently, our international airports are proposed to be open for limited commercial flights from August 1st. American Airlines plans to begin their direct flights from Miami to Guyana on August 2nd, and will be following with New York pretty shortly. Copa Airlines will begin a service from Panama to Georgetown on August, 21, August 21st. They do serve 14 hubs in the US and a couple in Canada as well, and it's the best connection from the West Coast. Eastern Airlines plans to begin its service from JFK New York again in August 2020, and JetBlue was, was positioned to start flying again in March 2020, but has now revised that to the spring of 2021, given the current, current situation with COVID-19. So it's great to know how to get to Guyana, but how do you get around once you're here? Our country has various landscapes and different ways to get to those tourism spots. Um, it's also a land of many waters, but out of the different types of transportation you can have, you will be traveling by land, air, or sea. When you go through land, it's gonna be through a vehicle or maybe a four by four if you're in the more rugged areas. And if you're in the Georgetown area, you're gonna use some private private or public transportation to get around the certain areas. Once you are on the waterways, you're gonna be in some jet boats like what is showcased here. And when you are in the jungles, the rainforest and some of our indigenous areas, you're gonna be in smaller speed boats or even canoes. Once you are in the capital city of Georgetown, you can fly to like the North Rupununi or the South Rupununi, Lethem and other different areas. And we usually use the smaller Cessna planes to get around there. There is the five-seater, nine-seater, and the 12-seater as well. Guyana has a lot to offer as a destination. And for someone that's now learning about it or want to delve in a little bit more, it can be a lot to put in a couple of words. But we have highlighted the five main areas that best encompass what we can offer as a destination. We offer authentic experiences in nature and wildlife, active exploration experiences, culture and heritage, birding and conservation and safe travel. Now, one of the greatest things about this destination is that although you may, you see these different pillars of tourism as we call it, there are many activities you can do that will be able to touch at least two of these ex two of these areas. You can go wildlife spotting and that will be an active exploration adventure as well as nature and wildlife. You can go on a birding trek um, through some of our many trails. You can go horseback riding and although it's a very active or a very exhilarating activity, it can also be very calming once you look at the surroundings that you have. 90% of the population lives on the coast, which leaves the interior regions of the country untouched and ripe for exploration. And no webinar or discussion about Guyana is complete without highlighting Kaichua Falls. This is the highest attraction that we have here in country. And standing at 704 to 1 feet, it is about four to five times higher than Niagara Falls. One of the greatest things about this country is that it is the land of six, six ethnic groups 
And you're gonna see all of these faces when you travel, but some of the most common faces will be those from African, East Indian, or indigenous descent. Actually, the one here, or African person, his name is Waldeck Prince, or Wally. He was also featured in our birding presentation and one of our best local guides here. So whenever you make it from down to Guyana, you might be lucky enough to have him as your guide. Now that we were able to get a little bit of a feel of where Guyana is and what our overall explanation of the area is, um, we're gonna carry you through some of our new products. So traditionally, Guyana is a place where it has authentic nature, adventure, and cultural experiences. And although we do have some boutique hotels um, in our capital city in Georgetown and Wi-Fi in, most of the, in all of those areas and some of our more coastal areas, a lot of the jewel or the, the highest attraction for our tourism product is our indigenous communities and villages. Here you will have a very well comfortable and accommodating place. However, by no means it's not a five-star luxury resort. We like to call it redefining the meaning of a luxurious experience. Why well, the accommodation will not be um, a five-star hotel quality. The overall experience is something that you will definitely treasure. With that being said, these new products are communities and areas that are being developed. So they are more rustic than what we traditionally offer here in Guyana um, at the current moment. The closest to being fully developed for a day tour and overnight excursion is Marakabai, and Candice will carry you through that. We just wanted to share all of the communities and products we are currently working with. So from the top left-hand corner, um, we have Warapoka, Lake Kapui, Chinapau, Karasabai, Wakapau, and St. Cuthbert's Mission. These are all indigenous communities that are being developed to be the next Rewa or Sarama, which, will, which are our more established community-led and own tourism products. On the bottom right hand, we did highlight Seven Curry Tour as well as the Guyana Rum Route. And these are experiences that are not traditionally indigenous in descent, but they are reflective of the Guyanese culture. And it's not specific to one area, but it's the overall experience and experiential travel. So with that, I'll hand it over to Candice so she can take us on a trip to Morocco Bay. Hi, everyone. It's really a great pleasure to welcome you and to take you through this virtual trip to Marikabai, which is located in Region 5 um, along the coast. So it's the only indigenous community that's located in Region 5, and it is actually very accessible from Georgetown. What is the best time to visit? Um, August, to early December, or January to late April. Um, anytime around um, May or July, you just have to become prepared to be a bit, a bit more adventurous um, as we you might encounter some rains. But um, generally, you have very good weather um, throughout the year. And how to get there? One hour away from Georgetown along the coast will take you to the Maikoni Creek. From there, um, you're greeted by a some smiling faces of the representatives from America Bay who will pick you up by a boat and take you along the Maikoni Creek. Now it's three hours away from um, the, the landing, or we call what we call the landing. Um, but what what is what makes it very interesting is that all along the route you can get a glimpse of Guyanese um, history and the way we live. But there are people who live along the banks of the creek. And as it transitions to a more natural setting, you get to enjoy just having that breeze um, hitting you in your face, tussling your hair, and really having um, a very natural experience. Uh, besides that, there are also opportunities for sightings along the creek. Um, the National Bird of Guyana, the Hoyson, is you can be if actually you get quite lucky to see it so it's almost a guaranteed sighting um on trips that i've taken i've seen um, the river otter and we've also seen some 
fun. The howl of the monkeys. Kind of says, oh, yeah, it. preparing me on one of those <laughs> trips. So hopefully sometime pretty soon. And I think what has made my experience really great is that we've had really good weather. So you've been just, I've been able to just enjoy the, the ride there. And, you know, with that expectation, you see the transitions from place to place. Um, what do you need to get? Of course, because it's um, recommended that you have light clothing, uh, come prepared, um, sneakers, sunglasses. Of course, make sure you put your camera in because you won't want to miss any photo ops along the way. Um, the regular guidance in terms of your hat, your sunscreen, some binoculars. And what is really the highlight? It's really that connection to nature, seeing a location that is very close to the coastal, but very different in, in its layout and its feeling. So you get to go into an indigenous village. Um, it can either be a day trip or an overnight um, experience as well, because we've worked on developing both. And really it's about connecting with nature, having the serene setting, and being able to have a glimpse into our indigenous way of life. And I will explain further about the experiences as we go along. So your day basically begins at around 6.30 when you arrive at Wash Close Landing, funny name. Um, and then you're really with, you get your lovely cup of coffee to start your day, coffee or tea. And you head up river as the head of the creek as the photo shows you. See, we're all packed for the journey. We do hope that you'll be able to join us on one of these trips sometime soon. And as you leave, as I said, you can have sightings along the way. Um, really just enjoy having that company. You, you'll have a, guided, a guide with you. So be able to provide different bits of information along the way and just get a, prepare you for your welcome at the village. So locally, um, a river is a wider, a river is a longer or wider body of water, but a creek is just a smaller version of that river. So a lot of times we will see the Escribo River or the Ripununi River, but then talk about Mainikoni Creek, because while it might seem as such a long and expansive body of water in this picture here, there are rivers that are twice, up to 15 times the size here. Right. And when you reach Marikabai, this is one of the sites that you'll see there. This is the bridge over there, um, since Francois Creek. Uh, we've named it Marikabai Mor Bridge for now. Interestingly enough, it never had a name before. But it's a significant site for the villagers because there is an, a story about um, indigenous conflict the Arawaks and the Caribs, um, and then the Arawaks having to retreat to safety. So when you visit, you will actually see that in the water, there is a, a stump from a moor tree, so type of tree that's there. And it's very significant for the residents, because they, they say that is what saved the Arawaks who inhabit, who live at Marikabai from the Caribs. So that's how, in part, how the, the community got its name. So what will you do there? Once you get there, you can be guaranteed that the smiling faces of the team will be there to meet you. Um, they're very new um, in, in terms of the whole experience and welcoming guests. But I think one of the great things that we've seen over a short period of time is them growing their capacity and they're so looking forward to being able to execute um, their skills and welcome people to their community. As you one of the highlights is actually after arrival, it's actually having the walk, the beginning of the village tour that will take you across the Mora Bridge that you previously saw, and they will explain the whole story to you. Marikba is also known for the many trees that it has, fruit trees and other trees that are native to the area. So you will also have the opportunity to learn about the diversity in that particular area. One of the things that you stop um, is to talk about the Ite Palm, and that that just sets the pace for what is to come later on in the tour. Apart from that, you make it to the landing, and then you have a great experience of going into a canoe and just drifting 
down the creek. It's about 10, 15 minutes, but I can assure you this is one of the highlights of this particular experience because you are just there and you're just in, enveloped in nature and everything is just peaceful. And for me, this is actually one of the highlights, what I really love about this um, experience. As we go on and you come out in the, at the other part of the village, the village has four zones. One of the highlights, the other highlights is really um, going to a home that has the cassava processing demonstration set up. Now cassava is a root set. Vegetable. vegetable yes yeah that is very important to indigenous peoples it is the staple from which they get their food and so many other byproducts so one of the things that they do um the cassava is, is processed and you can see in the photo the ladies in the top left hand yeah. corner the lady is scraping the, the skin off of the cassava that is then followed by a grating process and then thirdly, a uh, matapine process where the cyanide juice is extracted and then it sets the pace for the boiling out of that to get rid of the poisonous juices that are contained. Uh, so when you're there, you're actually going to get to see all the processes involved in this. And not only see, you're also going to have the opportunity to try your hand. So you're going to come. You're going to have the opportunity to scrape, grate, and do it every bit of the process. And the matapi as well, I think a great fact about it is that it is actually hand weaven by people in the village and yeah. this community. Yeah. So that does take a level of skill, one that I do not have. I don't know if Candice has it at this point in time, um, but it is quite something to see. And um, only this past weekend, we were actually featured on Uncharted with Gordon Ramsay where he actually went through this process in another village. So it'd be great um, to see that one that goes live on their YouTube page in about a week as well. Yes. So it follows the process in the first photo, the person is sifting. And the second, that's when the baking is happening. I've had the opportunity to actually flip my own cassava bread. Um, I haven't, I was, I didn't grow up in an indigenous community. So all of this is very new to me and very exciting. The last photo shows the finished product, which is the cassava bread. And we've added a component where you now taste your freshly baked cassava bread, fresh off of that pan and it's hot and just savory. Wondering. You can now have it with a, what we call tuma. To explain what is tuma, it's like an indigenous dish which is done through with the cassava, um, we call it cassava water, and that is boiled down into and seasoned. And you can add fish and any other type of meat to it. It's very, um, it's one of the dishes of our indigenous peoples. So once you finish baking your cassava bread, you actually have this experience. You're also allowed to take away your own cassava bread. So you have that as your showpiece for something that you've done on this trip. And then there's the Tacoma worm. And I can tell you the first time I saw the Tacoma worm, I've heard about the Tacoma worm for a long time, but actually going to Marika and working with the community um, actually came face to face with the Tacoma worm. So remember in the beginning, I told you about that day palm. Well, that palm, that's how it looks like in the first photo, there is a term that they use that they call setting. So the tree is cut and it's set for about four, four days prior. And when it's just right, the bark is cut to reveal the worm that is inside. Um, this is a delicacy of our indigenous people. Um, so you see Gary in the second photo, he's one of the guides from Marikabai. So he's explaining, um, and showcasing that worm and how they do it. And I can tell you, the first time I saw Gary do that, I didn't even blink and he popped it in his mouth just like that. And I was just left there like, okay. <laughs> it was a bit funny, but that tells you, there are two ways that you can eat it. Um, so you're open to eating it. One, you can have it just as raw. They clean it, they wash it out and you can just pop it in your mouth. Or you can do like what I did, have it roasted. In that way, you get rid of all the moving movements. 
that would be a nice approach as well. Um, so I've been asking a number of people, what did they think about it when they taste it? And everyone has a different opinion as, as to how this thing tastes. My personal opinion, I think it tastes sort of like roasted pork, for those who may know. Others have had the opinion that it tastes more like peanuts or cheese, grilled cheese. So the only way to know for sure is when you come and try it. And then you can let us know what you think. All right, so after you finish that stop at a house to have those experiences, you then continue with a walk through the village. Um, this walk is not extensive, it's very light. We walk at very leisurely pace and you're walking through the village. We're getting explanations about the different trees and, and fruit trees that you pass along the way. And then you make it to the center of the village where that is the main administrative center. And you learn more about the historical buildings of the community. After that, you take a couple minutes walk and you make it to the multipurpose Benab, which is um, it's constructed in a traditional Arawak way. So it's one of the few places in Guyana that you can actually have see that type of architecture uh, from our indigenous peoples. And there you will meet the crafters for the community. So besides telling you about the different crafts, you also have the opportunity to try your hand at stripping or plating mukru. This is one of the byproducts um, that they may craft with. And you can actually have the experience of um, weaving something that you can then take away from home. There are also crafts that are on sale. Um, because it's an Arawak village, it has, it's well known for its produce of craft items and they are very colorful and they range from all the way from mats to little baskets that you can have. Following that, um, now that you've seen the village, you actually head to the Benab that is in your photo there, lunch under the Benab. So you're overlooking the creek and the committee will set up lunch there and you can have, enjoy, depending on your choice, an indigenous dish or something else that is very tasty. Yeah. Um, a Benab too is what we would locally call attached roof structure. So that is our local term for it. In the indigenous communities, it's also a great meeting place. When you go back to the words, the history of the indigenous population in Guyana as well, they usually have a centered area that they had their meals or they had group meetings or their community meetings. And you will see in many indigenous villages that are in tourism or now aspiring to be in tourism also have this type of architecture and this type of structure within their village or even in the equal lodges which will be the accommodation for that area as well. Great. Thanks for that, Nicola. Yeah. Yes. And then you have some downtime. We've took you, taken you walking for most of the day. So now you have some time with some options. So one, you can either try your hand at canoeing. You will learn the skill of canoeing. And one of the specialized um, residents from the area, because this is one of the ways that they move up and down the creek is by canoe. So they can teach you that. You can further explore the village. You can check out all the spots that there are, or you can just relax. And in Guyanese term, you can chill. So it's a bit of chilling. So chilling usually refers to relaxation. You find something to fill the time. In this case, you can swing, we can have a hammock available and you can just relax, you got a book, Catch a five, as the Guyanese would say, which is a quick nap. And basically, those are your options. Um, and this is really can be tailored to your needs. There is no set um, itinerary for this part. It's just a it's an optional aspect of the itinerary. And then we prepare for your departure and then your return to Mykonian. But if you're desirous of spending the night, we can help you there as well. The, the photo um, shows the Eco Lodge that is currently under um, construction. It can currently hold, it has two rooms, capacity of four. Um, there's still some work to be done, but they're really hoping to really get this done as soon as this time passes. 
Um, but besides that, this area is set away from the village and it offers the opportunity of camping, which can easily be done. And it's a very natural setting. So if you wanna turn your day trip into an overnight experience, this is possible. The other things that are added to the overnight experience is that you have um, dinner by bonfire, you have a sort of an entertainment evening, which also offers an open mic or open floor. So you two can, can share with us your skills. And the next morning really looks like an early morning activity. I think one of the highlights of the overnight package is that you can, um, one of the aspects is the fishing aspect where you can catch your own meal. So what does that mean? So they, we go down the creek to a spot and you're actually taught how to do fishing the traditional way. And based on your catch, we then do a cook, what we, what we call a bush cook. So you're doing it in um, very, very rustic. rustic setting. Yeah, you're learning to do your, light your fire, get your wood, um, roast, we walk, your fish. roast your fish, you can have it roasted or boiled as we say, boiled. So you have like a mini camp out, but it's a very rustic experience. And I think this is really one of the highlights because you get to do so much and you learn so many skills um, in this particular aspect. Thanks so much for carrying us through that, Candice. I think what I just wanted to highlight too, that this is still a product that we are developing, but once travel opens up as well, we will be working with local operators and international operators to also offer this. I know pictures say a thousand words and videos show a little bit more. We actually do have one of our destination videos that carries you a little bit more in depth into the life of an indigenous person. So we are gonna share that now um, so that you can see a little bit more of what this community and other indigenous communities in Guyana has to offer. The fishing is very important here. It's our culture, it's the way we live, the way we hunt, the way we farm. We use the bow and arrow for fishing in the shallow water. And so I would stand on the bank to wait for the fish. And whenever I say fish, then I can shoot him. The food that I enjoy cooking is rose fish. We just eat it naturally. Maybe that's why the Amerindians are so strong today. We don't really suffer with any sickness. They are different groups of indigenous people, but we are from the Mokushi. Baskets are mainly made by the male because it is like a tradition for men to do handicrafts. For us, the indigenous people, what I believe is to maintain our culture, our way of life, to be identified. I learned to make cassava from my grandmother and mother. Cassava bread comes from the roots of the cassava tree. It's important to squeeze all the poisonous juice from the cassava. We've been using the cassava bread for hundreds of years in the indigenous communities. Armenian culture is important to my life because it was handed down from generation to generation. Cotton comes from a plant. We make hammocks, slings, handbags. We make the clothing. We live this natural and a communal life because it brings that strength. It brings perfect togetherness. This is wonderful. Wasn't that a great video? Um, Candice yeah. will now carry us through some of the other new products that are being developed, just to give a bit more of an overview. So she's gonna carry us through the village of Karasubai and then the other five that are gonna, that are still in the very early stages of product development on this end. Great. Yeah, I think that that video was very um, connecting to what we are actually discussing now. And there are so many other experiences that have to be captured there as well. But let's go to Krasabai. This is in the South Pakaraimas, Region 9. 
and they are known as our birding location or birding destination for the sunfire keys because that's the only place in the island that you can find it. It's an endangered bird. Um, so they've been welcoming visitors for uh, many years now who are in pursuit of checking this bird off of their birding lists. And if you look in the photo there, you see that little bena between the trees and the wrong, wrong structure. That is the Keze Eco Lodge. The Keze is actually the Makushi for sun parakeet. Um, so that is the location of their Eco Lodge. The village is currently working to expand their, their accommodation so that they can now um, in, increase their overnight visitors. But if you look at the photo, you see a lot of mountains. So this is a mountainous area and it is really defined by or defined um, to provide adventure experiences. So in here, you can actually have a lot of hiking, climbing, um, but I can tell you, even though the ascent may be steep at times, once you reach the top, it's really all worth it. It's a very beautiful place. And I can only say beautiful um, in a word, but really it's up to you to come and have that experience here. And then we head over to Warpoka. Warpoka is actually in region one, and it's one of the, the other communities that we're working very closely with. And we're um, very optimistic that in a very short space of time, we will be ready to launch this product as well. Um, what they're known for right now is that they have two Harp Eagle sites. Um, they do, it's a lot of insight into indigenous way of life. You look at the photo that captures what the village looks like, and it is also known as one of those locations where you can have candle wax making. Um, that makes it very distinct and makes it stand out. It's also the, the village is closest to the Shell Beach protected area. So work continues with that community. Um, Wakapau and Lake Apui are located in region two. And while they are in ways close to each other, they differ in, in character and, and feel and the experiences that they offer. Wakapau is one of those communities where you have a very strong um, indigenous culture. So most of this is really indigenous um, experiences. Um, they also have a local coffee making group. So that's one of the experiences that you can actually go and see how they do this production and also have your own cup of locally brewed coffee um, and thereby supporting livelihoods in that community. Lake Fui has a more um, we can kind of feel it's mainly for relaxation and um, more targeted to diaspora or um, locals or even weekenders. It's, it's mainly about relaxation. Um, Chinapau is the community that is closest to the Kaichiro National Park. And Nicole would have pointed out Kaichiro Falls. So what we are working with the community is to establish the link between the village and the national park. Uh, because it is a mountainous area as well, it will offer hiking opportunities between the two. And as we might have noted previously, these are all communities that are currently um, in the beginning stages and we still have uh, a bit to go, but we are working on defining the experiences. And again, it's very much known for its community-based experiences. And I can assure you that even though we have many communities that are interested or are actively um, involved in creating their, their own experiences, I think our main uh, approach to this has been to find what is unique about that particular area, what makes it stand out. Therefore, no two places that you visit will offer the same experiences, even though some things will remain um, across the board, like how we do cassava processing and all that, because that is very um, intrinsic to indigenous culture. And that is, that is a part that we can't get away from. But just to reassure you that, um, experiences will vary and we are really building on the positives and really those unique selling points for every location. I think what Candice is um, alluding to as well that throughout any experience in Ghana you're going to have some bit of nature, a bit of wildlife, a bit of culture, a bit of heritage, 
but every area and location you touch is unique in its own way as well. And that's what our product development team here is trying to do in building these communities up to welcome you in the near and distant future as well. Um, I know Candice had mentioned some regions, regions one, two, and nine. Locally, those are called our administrative regions. Um, but I know from a traveler point of view as well, and more geography based, we do look at the coastland, the rainforest, and the savanna areas. So Warapoka, Lake Kapui, Wakapal, Marakabai, and St. Cuthbert's Mission are all on the coastland area. And they do have a little bit of nature, um, trees, and experiences there. Chinapau is in our rainforest areas. So that will have a lot of green lush vegetation and a lot of rivers and waterways that you'll get to experience. Karasabai is on the border of our rainforest and savanna region. So by going to that area, you get a little bit of both worlds. And it's also closest to some of our more established circuits like the North Group Nuni circuit and the South Group Nuni circuit, which offers a lot more of the ranching cowboy and cattle experiences as well. So our next part of the presentation will now focus on some of the experiences we are working to develop outside of community-led and owned tourism based in villages. And we're going to start off with one of what Diana has the best to offer, and this is our rum. Yeah, rum. Rum is one of those things that connects us. You may not We're even over <laughs> on that end, but Candice Smile just jumped a lot on this end. Yeah. Um, having worked on the Ganner of Root, really, um, you know, it's a, it's a moment of pride as well, um, because we're working on something that puts us on a different pedestal. Um, and I think Diana has the, the distinction so far of being the first um, Caribbean country to have launched or at least started the process of launching the, the rum route. And for those who may or may not know, um, the Caribbean and Guyana have a very strong tie to sugar. Sugar is a very important part of our history and our culture. And our rums have won worldwide recognition um, over the years, no doubt. A trip to Guyana is never complete without the taste of our rum. So that being said, we've been really working on establishing these links and, and looking at the journey of sugar to, through the entire process until it becomes rum. So the Ghana rum route really pulls on the, the relationship between the sugar estates through the processes to the final product, um, which is the production of rum. So the rum route is set along the coastland of Guyana, and it has three different areas that we focus on. One is Georgetown, Burbies, and East Coast Highway, which includes um, stops at the LBI Estate, um, Skeldon Heritage Village Resort, sorry, and the Demerara Distillers Limited um, factory. Factory. factory, sorry. Yes, which is the home of El Dorado Rums. So number two would be the west coast of Demerara and Georgetown, which features the Guyana Heritage Museum, the Lenora Estate, the Eiffel Estate, and the Banks DIH Walking Plant. And then number three, it takes you to west coast Burbies, where you have the experiences at the Blairmont and Albion Sugar Estates. Um, which are very much operational at this point. And as with all things, while it's spread across a wide geographic area, it can either be an overnight itinerary or a day trip. Um, and really looking at those locations, what set those locations apart, or really building on their history, allowing you to understand the various stages in production of sugar. So you will have a factory tour, you get to visit the grounds, you get to go through all the processes. Some of it also includes actually visiting the fields while they are in production. So you can actually see the, what a cane harvester, um, a morning or a day in the life of a cane harvester, all the way down 
Um, Nicole, you wanted to add something about the hotels? Yeah. So a lot of our hotels here in Van are also boutique hotels and each has a different, um, and just like a lot of the products we're developing, they all have something that makes them uniquely different, uniquely theirs, even if they're two streets apart from one another or two um, towns away from each other. But a lot of these hotels, if you're not able to go on the official route, um, depending on your itinerary, which is always customizable here in Guyana, we do or they do offer um, rum tasting within that hotel as well. So it might be a good way to kind of test the waters before going on the rum route. Or if you do have a trip that's already planned and not able to accommodate the rum route at this point in time, it'll be a good way to whet your appetite. Um, one of the other tours that we are developing here is called a seven curry tour. Seven curry is a traditionally Hindu meal that's served in a lot of religious functions and holidays. And while it's not a typical experience that is open to a lot of travelers who might just be coming in, you do get some variations of the meals at different restaurants and local areas. But the entire experience is something that we wanted to capture to have a lot of people understand this aspect of Guyanese culture as well. The name seven curry comes from the composition of the meals. It's seven curries. And we have worked with a local tour operator here to carry you through that entire process so that you can see, learn more about this dish, learn more about the history, the smells, the spices, and go through that process. So on the photo on your right, um, just to explain what these seven curries are from the orange substance, that is pumpkin. There is rice and dal, which is made from uh, split peas, which is pressured or cooked into a soupy substance. It's then followed by chana and potato, and chana is our local name for chickpeas. We do have a very spicy chutney, which we locally call achar, which is made from dried green mangoes and seasoned with a lot of spices and peppers. Mango curry. We have something called baju, which is that deep green substance, and it closely resembles spinach that you can find in your supermarkets. We have a fruit called katahar, which is also in a curried, um, it's cooked in a curried way, which is based with masala and jira. And we also have something called balanje and edo curry. But balanje for us is the local name of eggplant. So it's, an, it's a stewed eggplant that's made with the curry flavors. That's more traditional of our masala and jira as well. So when you get on this tour, um, it does carry you through a couple different areas. The very first stop will be to a local factory where you can see where some of our local spices are made, which is the garam masala, jira, um, chili peppers, black pepper, to see what that process is like on that end. From there, you will go to a local curry shop, which is what we term that name for dal puri or naan. It's slightly different than traditional Indian naan because it has split peas mixed into the recipe and into it. From there, you will you and your guide will go to one of our local stops where you can actually pick the puri leaf. And this leaf is the water lily leaf that is that our Victoria Amazonica, which is one of our giants, sit upon. After you make this stop, your guide will carry you through one of our local markets. You can see all of the fresh fruits and vegetables and you learn more about the ingredients that we have for that dish, how to prepare it, how to buy it, how to make it. And you will not go away empty handed. You will be buying some of the ingredients here to carry back and you cannot go back without your heat of Guyanese spices and a little bit of heat, which is what that picture on the top right hand corner is. That is called our local weary, weary pepper. And it's a lot hotter um, than most of the ones found around this world as well. Once you get back to your location, which is a nice um, local backyard feel area, you're gonna help the local chef cut and prepare your meal. And at the end of the day and at the end of the tour, the best part happens. You get to actually have your meal. Traditionally, this is served in a lot more of a religious setting. So a lot of times we don't serve alcohol at those areas. But for this tour, I think it's okay to add some Eldorado rum into it. What do you think, Candice? Definitely. <laughs> 
So before we close off, um, we hope everyone had a good time learning about the experiences, but I know one of the big questions in the room right now is what is happening with Guyana in relation to COVID-19. So currently in the country, we have had up to yesterday, 285 confirmed cases that are active. We've had 16 deaths and 125 persons recovered. Our total number of testing is just about 3,000 persons in our population and communities. We know that health and hygiene will play a big part um, in our local, in how we do things locally between businesses as well as welcoming travelers back to the country. So the GTA has a health and sanitation protocol that we use and shared with local tourism providers to formulate their individual policies. We have a heavier emphasis that we place on our licensing process with working with the local businesses that we license, as well as Candace and her team yeah. will be putting this at the forefront, even more so for all of the products and communities that they work with. We are taking a bit more stricter policy to ensure that your safety, the safety of everyone in the country, those coming to Ghana and exploring Ghana is taken care of. When our airports are scheduled to open up, um, August 1st will be open for limited commercial flights and continued repatriation flights to get our Guyanese back home. And from September 1st, there will be an increase in commercial flights. These are also based on how cases are continuing in Guyana and internationally as well. When you are coming to Guyana, the current protocol is that you do have to have a medical certificate that shows negative molecular bi biological chain reaction or PCR test for short um, for COVID-19 at least 24 hours before your departure port of ex exit. Your airline coming to Guyana will ask for this as well as once you are here on the ground. You must wear a mask when in the airline um, as well as when in our local airports. The individual airport you're leaving from might have a separate different policy but most are following those general guidelines. And we ask that you provide correct information on the health declaration form that you will be asked to fill once you are in country as well. When you, are, when you do get off of your plane in Guyana, a team will be there to disinfect you as well as disinfect your baggages. Um, this is the current protocol at this time and when Guyana is proposed to be open from August first for international travel and into September as well. As the situation advances and changes, um, I'm sure these protocols will also be updated as well as everyone else um, around the world. And we are here to give you that support and give you that information that you need. For more information, please visit our website, againatourism.com. We actually just went through a revamp process and do have a couple last minute things to make, but it's a great place to get started and to learn more about the destination. You can visit exploreguyana.org, which is the website link for the Tourism and Hospitality Association of Guyana. This is a private sector, sector sister agency to the GTA and is a membership-based organization. For more information about statistics on Guyana, please visit the official website of Government of Guyana's Bureau of Statistics. For investment opportunities, please visit the website of Guyana Office for Investment, GoInvest at goinvest.gov.gy. And for more information on all, one of our main ports of entries that serves the North American markets, please visit www.cg airport-gy.com and they will also have their updated policies for travelers coming into Guyana as well. Um, before I hand it off to Jenna for any questions you guys might have or just closing it off, I think we just want to say thank you so much on this end for you guys to take your time up from your day to learn more about some of our new products in the pipelines, the ones that are a bit more ready and will be ready very shortly. And, the, and giving us your time to learn more about all of the other areas that we do have petitioned and planned for later on for our tourism development. Um, this is our team at the Guyana Tourism Authority, and we do give support for key information, assist with coordinating travel-related events, joint advertising, support from familiarization trips, reception of the airport, and help you to connect with our local sector as well so that more people can experience and discover Guyana. Thanks, Jenna.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Nicola and Candice, for your time today and a great presentation on Guyana. It sounds like there's some really exciting and fun new things happening there. I know me personally, I've, I've never been to Guyana, but I have tried the rum and it is my top favorite rum ever. So that rum tour is very high on my list of things to do. Um, now, as Nicola mentioned, if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them through now. I want to say thank you to everybody. I know we it's a bit of a longer one today, so thank you for everyone for finishing off with us today. If you do have any questions, please feel free to type them through now. Um, I do have one question here for you, Nicola. I'll probably keep it very short since we're um, almost at 3 p.m. here, but uh, the first question is, do you have beaches and are they good for snorkeling? And what is the weather like on the coast? Um, well, we do have some beaches, but it's not your traditional sun, sand and sea, like what would be advertised in Barbados. A lot of our water is what we would call Black Creek water because we do get our water systems from the Amazon basin. So a lot of our beaches are found within our Esquibo circuit area where there are a lot of nature resorts, um, nature resorts around that area and supporting beaches. You do have some ones on the coast as well, but those beaches there are for, as you, are your main points to start off kayaking, swimming, um, or just relaxing, or as Candace would call it, chilling. Um, we don't have a lot of snorkeling here in Diana. And there are some festival areas or festive um, events that happen throughout the year. And those are more tied towards individual activities and events that are planned by individual organizers here. In terms of weather, I'd like to say we're summer all year round, but based on the seasons Candice had highlighted, we do have two main seasons here. Uh, we do get a lot of sunshine throughout the year, but we also have a period of time when we do see a lot more rainfall um, in Guyana, in the coast and in our interior areas, and that is May to August, July, August. You can travel during those times. You do have a lot of different experiences. It makes the waters a bit higher, so it's easier to travel by boat. You do get closer to see um, some of the birds and the trees, but it does make some amount of travel slightly difficult because a lot of some of our activities are weather-based. Um, one of the best things about that though is that you're never gonna go too far or too long without having that experience. Um, and it's also a great time to visit as well if you have, if you'd like to see some of our waterfalls like Hydro Falls at its highest peak also. Do you have anything to add, Candace? No, I think you got it before. <laughs> Perfect. So another question for you, Nicola. How long is the rum tour? So the rum tour on the three options there, we do have some that are full day and overnight, and then some that are just day options. So depending on which ones you choose, it can be the entire day and then come back that night, or it can be extended into an overnight period. Candice can share a little bit more. Yeah, adding to that, I think it's, yeah, just three dimensions. So it's, you can have a half day tour, a few hours, you can have a full day, or you can have the overnight experience. I think it just comes down to what is it that you're looking for and how you, we customize that particular itinerary for you. And one thing too, I think we did mention and allude to every itinerary in Diana, whether you work with um, an international operator on year end or want or get support on this end, it is very customizable. You will get a little bit of experience in everything, but we do cater a lot to your needs, what your dietary restrictions are, the things that you would like to see as your highlights. If you just wanted to see a taste of what Diana has to offer, especially if it's your first trip. And I think especially now with COVID-19, we are putting a lot more emphasis on better catering to those travelers and being a better destination to welcome you all here as well. All right, so I'll just ask one more question and then if there are any questions that we don't get to, we will make sure to answer those for you in the webinar follow-up. So don't worry, you will get the answers if we are not doing it live right now. So the last one I have is, what are the facilities like in the areas that you discussed today um, in terms of running water, um, Wi-Fi, et cetera? Okay, 
um, just to know that these are all works in progress um, and we are addressing, especially with the communities that we're working with, um, we're paying attention to electricity supply using um, solar panels. We, we're very much looking at the sustainability aspect of it, um, water supply, um, uh, Wi-Fi as well at some of the locations. So these are things that we are keeping um, abreast of and putting plans in place to, to get these done. Uh, just know that we are still in the very, probably in the first phase of some working with some of these communities. But for the more established ones, Warpoka, um, um, Marika Bay, and sorry. So I know Karas, uh, but I have Karasabai. lots of um, yeah. these here, they are modeled after communities like Sarama or Rewa, which, are some of our crown jewels in community-led and owned tourism that has been around for quite some time. In those areas, they do have solar powers that give them electricity, they have running water. There is Wi-Fi that you can pay about $5 US for access to it. However, it's only at the main office or location within the lodge. And there is um, a period of time in the night about 11 to four o'clock in the morning where you can get that free Wi-Fi that you can use. However, the Wi-Fi that you get when you pay there, it's not strong enough to be able to send images um, at certain areas. It's mostly very text-based. Um, but to be quite honest and speaking from someone that is from the, the city side of Georgetown and going in there, personally, it does the first day might be a little bit difficult, even if you know about the situation before, but by the second day, you wouldn't even want to miss it. Um, a lot of our, what we encourage travelers to do is that you're there to connect with nature and disconnect from some of those areas as well. So it's definitely quite an experience. Yeah, that's wonderful. I know any time that I can have my phone turned off and have an excuse that I don't have access to Wi-Fi, it's my favorite. So um, thank you so much for sharing all of that information with us again, Nicola and Candice, and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, if there's, if you want to add anything else, Nicola, if not, I will say goodbye to everyone for the day. I think we're good on this end, Jenna. Thank you for being our partner over there. Perfect. Well, thank you, everybody, again, for joining us. I will send out the recording to everyone next week. It'll also be posted on our Emerging Destinations YouTube channel and on our Emerging Destinations website. So there's a couple different places to access that. But please feel free to reach out to either Nicola or myself if you have any other additional questions. We'd be more than happy to help you. So thank you very much and have a wonderful Thursday.